Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. Let's continue our, our series on hadith. And I want to look at um, the rise of hadith forgery. Can you tell me why this came about? Why were hadith being forged? Well, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you can well imagine the scene that uh, people are not only mourning the loss of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as their beloved uh, prophet and, and the person that they love to have around, uh, but uh, they were now suddenly cut off from that source of direct instructions uh, that they felt, you know, is coming from a person who is guided by God. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to know what to do next, um, and they couldn't ask the Prophet directly. Directly, but somebody would remember, uh, oh, uh, for a situation like this, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have acted thus. Um, and, and so that becomes now an instruction which is passed on. People would receive that. Uh, some may act on it. Some may think, well, wait a minute, uh, maybe you didn't remember exactly. Um, or I remember differently. <laughs> and so there will be competing bits of information about uh, what the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have said or would have done uh, in a certain situation or what instructions he used to give for a certain circumstance. Uh, but uh, the, the forgeries start to occur when people cannot uh, remember exactly um, and, uh, and, and they want to make something up. And um, why would people make anything up? Well, uh, sometimes just just the need to have uh, some instruction. Humans are humans after all. And uh, within the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Quran notes that there were people within the Muslim community who were not genuinely Muslim. Uh, so we can well imagine that uh, people from, from that angle might come in with things which are not really true. Um, uh, either to serve their own purposes or are just on the spur of the moment. Somebody wants to be the champion who has some information to offer here, even if nobody has any genuine information. Uh, but we also see that uh, there was a, a rise of political entities, mm -hmm. uh, the clashes within the community very early on, some supporting this person, some supporting the other person. After the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, it wasn't clear to Muslims uh, right away uh, as to who should be the, the person that will take the reign of government after him. Of course, he was a prophet, and there could be no one to replace him in his prophetic role, but he was also uh, a, a political leader. Uh, so who would uh, take on his political uh, role? Uh, some championed Ali, the cousin, uh, who was also the son-in-law of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, some championed Abu Bakr, who was uh, a close companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet's father-in-law. Um, and eventually the community settled on uh, Abu Bakr, but uh, only after some hesitation among uh, some persons. And uh, it is said that even Ali uh, came to take the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr after some months had passed. And uh, Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, also had some uh, run-ins with, with Abu Bakr. They were not uh, entirely... Um, uh, seeing things uh, in, in the same way. So was it like a, a Sunni-Shiite split so, at that so time? Of course, we wouldn't call it Sunni-Shiite split at that time. That, but the origins of it. The, the origins, you can say, um, are, are there. Or, uh, you know, once a split occurs, people would look back and they would see, you know, that's where it all began. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with these uh, tensions in the, in the society, uh, some people would support Ali, some would support Abu Bakr. And how do you support? By remembering that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said something in favor of Ali or remembering that the Prophet said something in favor of Abu Bakr. And then what if you could not remember something exactly? People started to make things up and, and uh, not in, necessarily in the earliest years, but as time progresses, more and more this would be done. So introductory books on hadith written by Muslim scholars would uh, um, tell us that uh, that one of the reasons why we have forgeries in hadith is that those who supported Ali, uh, may God be pleased with him, uh, invented hadith uh, to, to support him. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when uh, the Sunnis heard about this, uh, they started to invent hadith to support Abu Bakr, on the other hand, uh, to counter the inventions of the others. And then when the Shi'is or proto-Shi'is um, uh, saw what the Sunnis were doing, they increased their efforts all the more. 
Uh, and so you have forgeries, countering forgeries, and counter counter forgeries. Mm -hmm. um, but that but was there not were the other political um, divisions occurring at that time. I believe it wasn't just the Sunni Shiite sort of beginnings of the split that we were seeing. True. True. When uh, Ali established the caliphate, um, he, he became the fourth person in, in line and in, in fact became the caliph at that time. Uh, at the same time, there was Muawiyah in Syria, uh, who was uh, a relative of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, or at least a relative of uh, uh, Uthman, and, uh, uh, who was the third caliph. Mm -hmm. And uh, Muawiyah, um, uh, in a way, a champion in his own leadership. And so we had a faction there and a, a, a massive uh, rift in the community leading to civil war. And uh, naturally in that situation of civil war, people were fighting not only with swords, but also with words. Mm -hmm. And uh, what better words to fight with than words which can be attributed back, attributed back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. So some said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this in favor of uh, Muawiyah. And, and so on, championing one cause over over the the other faction. But it was not only political issues that gave rise to forgery in Hadith. Um, uh, there were also um, uh, uh, personal concerns. Uh, it would be said that uh, a, a man is having a you know a hard time um, keeping his wife where he wants her to be. You know. Uh, he thinks that she should be in her place and she is exerting herself or asserting herself. Mm -hmm. And um, he can't tell her, you know, uh, you have to listen to me because she's not going to listen. But uh, he circulates a, a saying within the community um, uh, that a woman should hear and, and feel subdued. Uh, and, and that saying he attributes to the prophet, peace be upon him. He tells somebody else, knowing that somebody else will tell somebody else, will tell somebody else, and eventually it'll come back to his wife. When his wife hears that, his wife would listen <laughs> to, to what the Prophet, peace be upon him, purportedly said. But of course, it's an invention. So what evidence do we have that that's an invention? Well, in fact, this has been widely acknowledged by Muslim scholars. This, um, this comes from their careful examination of the various chains of narrators. They tried to trace back who said this. And if the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this, it must have been heard from by other people as well. They would be asking, how is it that only one person said this? And this looks suspiciously like it was invented by somebody for this purpose. Either, you know, somebody to, uh, invented this to support a political faction or, you know, men invented this to put women in their place. It is narrated, for example, that Aisha, the mother of the believers, uh, sometimes heard men saying something and she said, you guys are saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, she, she was objecting because uh, she lived close to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for many years. Uh, she knew the kinds of things that he taught, what he stood for. And when she heard what they were saying, she realized that this could not be a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so the gentleman made this up or they made a mistake. They might have misremembered uh, or confused uh, what, what they remembered. So what do you think is the extent of, the, of these forgeries then? How widespread well, was it? This was actually very widespread so that it could be reported that uh, when uh, Al-Imam al-Bukhari uh, went about his work of trying to collect and sift the various narratives, he started with a pool of 600,000 uh, hadiths. And uh, out of that, he selected uh, some 7,400, uh, which he graded as sahih or authentic. Now, that's not the only grade of acceptable hadith in, in Islamic uh, jurisprudence. There are lesser grades. But uh, if you start with 600,000 and you narrow it down to 7,000, you can see the vast difference. Mm -hmm. Although in the 600,000, there will be repetitions. Uh, so um, each each chain, uh, l l let me step back for a moment and explain this a little bit more. So a, a hadith comes down to us nowadays um, through a chain of narrators. 
um, so the Prophet, peace be upon him, said something. One of his companions heard it. That companion tells somebody else, who tells somebody else, who tells somebody else. Uh, then you have one chain of narrators going all the way down until it comes to be recorded many generations later by Imam Bukhari or someone else. So that's a chain of narrators. But now, suppose the Prophet, peace be upon him, told two people, who then each told two people, who then each told two people, it branches out to two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And so you can have 64 different chains of narrators uh, narrating basically the same thing that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said. So the one saying becomes 64 uh, separates hadiths. Mm -hmm. So uh, among the 600,000, you will have many repetitions like this, basically the same one saying. Uh, but nonetheless, th this, this, uh, the contrast between the number that Imam Bukhari started with and the number that he included in his collection is often um, used to dramatize the importance uh, or, or the, the vast difference between uh, the pool that was available and the, the uh, the, the, the selection that could be made and uh, that could be uh, relied upon. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Shibir, I want you to tell me a little bit more about, you started mentioning what the, how the scholars evaluated hadith, and I want you to tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so a scholar like Imam al-Bukhari would be asking basically two questions. Um, one question is about the chain of narrators. And the other question is about the text that is being related itself. Uh, so let's think about the chain of narrators. So what are the considerations there? If, if person A says uh, that he heard from person B, who heard from person C, who heard from person D, uh, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said X, Y, Z, then we want to know about the A, B, C, and D, these persons. Uh, first of all, uh, are, are they known to be good persons in, in, in the Islamic society? Because I've already mentioned previously that uh, uh, they, they were what is referred to in the Quran as munafiqun, hypocrites, uh, who were there in the community, but they were not good Muslims. They, you know, technically, they're not even Muslim because uh, they're professing the faith, but internally, they're not really there. Mm -hmm. um, that's not for us to judge, but that's the Quranic judgment on them. I mean, we couldn't say, look at a Muslim and say, oh, but you're just professing the faith, but you don't have it there because we don't know what's in their hearts, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the Quran makes that differentiation. But uh, that alerts us to the fact that in the Muslim community, there would have been people that you could not trust, um, but we wouldn't know one from the other. But uh, the, the Hadith scholars had to... Um, uh, take the necessary steps to evaluate the persons. And, and they felt uneasy about this at first because uh, it would mean that you're trying to judge individuals. How, how do you know what's in the heart of this person? Mm -hmm. uh, but for the, for the sake of evaluating the hadith, they had to take that leap and say, okay, we're going to take from the persons whose piety and, and uh, devotion to the faith are well established. Uh, and we're going to leave off the others that we're not so sure about. So then they started to draw books of hadith that uh, of hadith narrators um, lists of the narrators you can check a biographical dictionary this is the name of the person uh, what do other evaluators say about this person somebody may say that this person is honest somebody may say he is trustworthy somebody may say on the other hand that he's a liar or maybe worse than a liar he's a dajjal which means <laughs> uh, you know like something like the antichrist um uh, a, 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 and so on. So, so looking at these uh, evaluative uh, um, snippets that have been given by other experts in the field, uh, a person like Ali Imam Bukhari would then be uh, confident in a, a, including some narrators and excluding some others. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, that, that's about the honesty of the unreliability of the narrator as a person himself, uh, given his like his. Um, trustworthiness as, a, as an individual. But then what about his trustworth trustworthiness in terms of relating hadith? Because he could be a good individual, righteous, pious, um, honest, but uh, maybe he doesn't have a good memory. And this too was noted by the scholars. And how do they note this? Because they, they, they look at a teacher having, uh, uh, let's say, six students, and five of them narrate a certain saying one way, and the sixth one, he narrates it in an odd way. Uh, so they know that this is the odd man out. He perhaps misremembered. Uh, maybe his memory is a little faulty. So they will note this down. So he becomes a less reliable narrator, not because of anything about his person, but because of his human failing. Um, 
Now, uh, what about the chain of narrators itself? Uh, so if each individual by himself is a good and upright person with good memory, uh, did they actually meet each other? Because one person may say, I got it from that person. The person A says, I got it from B. But maybe between A and B, there is another person who was not mentioned. Maybe mm -hmm. A didn't really get it from B. Maybe A got it from A prime, who got it from B. <laughs> but, but we want to know who's the A prime. And, and A prime is not mentioned. And so this is a lacuna in that chain of narrators. And that uh, raises a question mark because we don't know who's that person. We cannot evaluate this chain. And so that has to be left aside. Mm -hmm. So considerations like this is about the chain of narrators. Now, looking at so the... So that seems pretty thorough. It, it's a very tar thorough process. Yeah, it's very painstaking. Um, a lot of work has gone into that. And we must admire the scholars who did this great work. Now, they looked at the text of the, of the narrative itself. So is this the kind of thing that uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, might have said? Or, or uh, could one of the enemies of Islam invent this uh, for their own purposes and they foisted it on, on unsuspecting Muslims? Uh, so, so they looked at the text of the narrative itself and to ask, is this the kind of thing that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have said? Or is this some kind, there is some kind of an anomaly, which they refer to uh, as a shaz, which means uh, that this uh, narrative differs from what else is being narrated on that uh, subject mm -hmm. uh, or is there some illa in it? Uh, this is an Arabic word which means some kind of cause or, or reason uh, for, uh, for rejecting it. Uh, might, maybe there is something in the narrative itself which uh, gives the feeling to a, 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 a hadith collector that this is not really a genuine uh, narrative from the Prophet, peace be upon him. So how serious and detailed was this textual analysis? Because I know that some critics of Islam or of the Hadith sciences say that, you know, th there wasn't really much of a textual analysis. Yes, although in theory, the, the textual analysis was always there. As I've already mentioned that Aisha, the mother of the believers, already did this. She would hear the text of the narrative and she would say, it couldn't be that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes she would compare it with the Quran and she would say, okay, uh, the Quran says uh, uh, one thing and uh, people are narrating uh, uh, the almost the opposite of what the Quran says. And she would say, no, it couldn't be. They, they have um, misremembered because the Quran says this and it couldn't be that the Prophet said the other thing. Uh, so uh, the, uh, this pr um, uh, um, practice of evaluating the text was there from the inception. But uh, eventually what, is, what happened in Islamic history is that people started to move away from uh, using reason and uh, uh, towards reliance more on narrative. So if you, have a, if you have a narrative, let's say we're having a discussion about what should we do next, and somebody says, oh, but you know the Quran says this is what we should do. Now that, that, that kills all discussion, mm -hmm. right? Because as good Muslims, we're going to submit to what the Quran mm -hmm. says. A similar thing happens with the introduction of hadith into the discussion. Once we're, we're thinking about what we're going to do, and somebody comes and says, you know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this is what we should do. So now that settles the matter. We're going to submit. So the more and more hadiths came to be introduced into uh, the public discussions, uh, the less Muslims had the scope to use reason to think about how to do things and so on. And so hadith tended to take over. And uh, of course, if these were all genuine narratives from the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, this uh, would have given us more uh, of a comfort that uh, we are doing the right thing here by following the hadith. But uh, a, a lot has been uh, forged, as we already mentioned. And when the hadith scholars were doing this evaluation, uh, they were already in the mood to just simply take the hadith uh, w uh, without uh, scrutinizing the text so much, uh, especially as many generations had passed and there were a lot of hadiths to deal with. And um, uh, there, there was also the sense that uh, they, they wanted hadiths to speak about the wide scope of Muslim uh, activity in all areas. Uh, and, and once you have that sense that you, you want more hadiths, you, you want hadiths to speak on a subject. You see, again, I spoke about the discussion and then somebody introducing uh, the hadith and that kills the discussion, mm -hmm. right? But there is also the desire that arose among Muslims in this period that we want more hadiths. We want the hadith to speak about the subject. We don't want to think about it anymore because our, my thinking 
thinking is going to be different from your thinking is going to, that's going to be different from the other person's thinking and whose thinking is going to be right. How do we know whose thinking is right? So to settle the issue, let's get a hadith on the subject. So if nobody comes to introduce the hadith, we go out searching for the hadith. You want to go ask somebody else, do you know a hadith on this subject? And when you go ask somebody else, do you know a hadith on the subject, somebody will say they know a hadith on the subject, even if they didn't know before. Uh, so with, so do with, you think that let's, we have these six books that we, we consider pretty good in terms of the, um, the sahih nature of them, how authentic they are? Do you think that these contain, um, still after all of the scholarly analysis and evaluation, they still contain many fabricated hadith? It, it depends on which of the books we're talking about. Uh, there are six books which are referred to generally as the Siha Sitta. Uh, among them is uh, the collection uh, of Al-Imam Ibn Majah. Ibn Majah's uh, collection has been criticized by many scholars, and um, uh, the, there is a recent book by Dr. Israr Ahmad Khan called uh, Authentication of Hadith, uh, Revaluating um, the Criteria. Um, so in, in that book, he, he noted that uh, Ibn Majah's collection has been said to contain uh, many fabricated uh, hadith. Um, among the others, uh, you might find hadiths which are on a spectrum uh, from being authentic on the one hand uh, to being uh, weak on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Hardly does anyone say that uh, there are fabrications in the others, uh, partly because we respect the books so much. But uh, careful scholars uh, who go into these books in detail, uh, they may weed out one or two and say, okay, this one is uh, to be left aside because uh, the uh, chain of narrators is faulty or something of that nature. But even then, there is uh, a lot of hesitation in, in using reason uh, to evaluate the text of the, of the narratives. And because the uh, reason has, uh, has not been used as much as we would like, uh, even though in principle it was always acknowledged uh, as, as a valid uh, method of evaluating the hadith, uh, we have hadith in the major collections which uh, have given uh, cause for pause to some of our greatest scholars. Um, uh, we, we have, for example, um, a, a, a hadith, we, we spoke about the different factions inventing things. Um, we have a hadith which speaks about 12 imams, um, and that's in the Sunni collections. And, and we know that the uh, 12 imams right away is... Uh, that know, arose much later. It, yeah, it, that was an idea that came later among the, the Shi branch. Um, so Dr. Shabir, let's pick up this topic a little bit later because we want to end uh, for now and then continue the series next time. And next time we'll be looking at what are the problems and controversies that arise when we have these forged hadiths or, or these weak hadith uh, within the collections. Sure. Look, Sophia, my inbox is full. I have questions from our viewers. Wow, that's yeah. quite a bit. Your questions are coming out of my ears. That's why we've got something really exciting planned for you, a YouTube Live Q&A. You can join us live and Dr. Shabir will answer your questions as they come in. This event will kick off our special Ramadan programming as well as our fundraising campaign. It's all happening on Sunday, April 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, Quran Speaks. And that's right before Ramadan. I can't wait to see what questions we'll get. Me too. It'll be fun to chat with you in real time. Subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss this event.